Mornings at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Good morning. It is January 15th. Welcome to your Wednesday, everybody. Weather-wise, not too pretty, but we'll get to details on that in just a minute. All right, I guess this is kind of like Terminator come to life. It's exactly like Terminator come to life, especially when you see a, a picture of this guy. A self-declared iBorg filmmaker can record up to 30 minutes of footage with a his Terminator-style prosthetic eye that glows red and has an embedded camera. His name is Rob Spence. He's 47 years old. He lost his sight in his right eye as a child following a shotgun accident. He had his eye removed in 2008. He decided to replace it with a prosthetic containing a video camera. One that could record interview subjects. The camera in the prosthetic is not connected to Spence's optic nerve, so it does not restore the vision in his right eye. No, but it can capture everything it sees, transmit the video to a receiver from where it can be recorded, played on a monitor, or uploaded online. Battery runs about 30 minutes. He said, quote, for me, uh, being an iBorg is all about taking a bad situation and making it better. An interesting thing, too, it captures literally right off of his point of view so it has glancing around blinking and everything while it records he said i don't just have to fit in with the prosthetic i can celebrate my cyborgness which i guess is a word now mm -hmm. and individuality there you go so <laughs> congratulations to him and i bet it does make for some interesting video i even look like the, the camera angle there with the, the shadow on the, the the one side so you can actually see the eye he looks exactly like, like terminator uh like arnold schwarzenegger in terminator one two three four five hundred and six sure. exactly there's probably been more uh, Terminator movies than rambo movies right i think so probably so although i could be wrong so we'll be back after your rundown After a month-long delay, impeachment is set to take center stage in Washington once again. Speaker Nancy Pelosi says the House will vote today on a resolution to move things to the next phase. Investigators have a new piece of evidence as they look into the shootdown of a passenger plane over Iran. New video shows an Iranian missile launching and exploding near the plane, taking out its communications, and then a second missile launches and reaches the jet. In Houston this morning, police have arrested a suspected gunman and a second person following a shooting at an area high school. School. The arrest came nearly four hours after a male student was shot and killed at Bel Air High School yesterday. The search for a missing Ohio teenager has ended in tragedy. The body of 14-year-old Harley Dilly was found in the chimney of a vacant house. Harley was last seen walking to school before Christmas. Today, a preliminary trade deal between the U.S. and China is expected to be signed by President Trump and Chinese leaders. The document estimated to be more than 80 pages long. The MGM Grand and Mandalay Bay are being sold in a price Price tag, four and a half billion dollars. Northeast ISD dropping class ranking for all students who are not in the top 10 percent. It's the first district in San Antonio to make the move, and it's a plan that's been in the works since 2018. The question of the greatest Jeopardy player in history has been settled for now. Ken Jennings has earned the title of GOAT after beating James Holzhauer and Brad Rutter in four games. Fans of Baby Yoda will be able to make their own version. Build a Bear now says it has a Baby Yoda kit available soon. So get ready for long lines. Take a look at Vanessa Jackson holding her twin daughters. They were born exactly one year after their twin brothers. Whoa. All four siblings now share the same birthday. A bonanza. What are the chances? I mean, exact birthdays? Two boys and then two girls? Statistically, I, I, I don't know. Wow, that's going to be a big old birthday party every year. Every year and Christmas and everything else. 901, 71 degrees. Mike Oster Hage is in for Justin Horn today. It's real pretty out there, Mike. No, but actually better looking than the past couple of days. Yeah, not uh, as heavy fog. Yeah, we we didn't we did have some fog. We still have some fog out there. We had some mist and drizzle this morning, but things are now, though, I want to say improving a little bit. Uh, the dense fog advisory, which was in effect for most of the morning, was canceled about uh, roughly 7:30 this morning. 71 here in town. We are, we've stayed about uh, upper 60s, low 70s, almost 30 degrees above normal this morning. And the humidity, yeah, you notice that when you step outside. There's a little bit of a wind out of the south. And as far as visibility, we do still have some fog in portions of the hill country as of right now. Visibility is pretty good out there at the airport. Rock Springs has come up considerably because it was at uh, zero for the longest time. Quarter mile right now in Del Rio. As expected with all this moisture in the atmosphere, first of all, these numbers, yeah, they're way, way, they're way above the normal high temperature this time of year. Mold came up considerably, as did mountain cedar. And I have a 
scary uh, suspicion that mountain cedar may really go up this weekend because we had another front moving through here by Saturday. Prior to that, some decent rain chances. We'll talk about that in a moment. Thank you very much, Mike. 410 at Ingram. Traffic looking okay down on the frontage road and also on the freeway itself. Same 435, the upper and lower levels at Brooklyn. Top stories that we're following for you today. Investigators are expected to return to a northwest side strip mall this morning to try to determine what sparked a fire last night. Fire happened at the Crown Point Center off of Culebra. San Antonio Fire Department says someone living in the apartments behind the strip mall called 911 when they saw smoke coming from the rooftop. Everyone at the shopping center was evacuated. No one was hurt. Our Sarah Acosta will have the latest on the investigation coming up on the news at noon. Via looking to the future of transportation, and they want to hear from you about what you think the new trains plan should be. It's a 10 year plan called Via Reimagined. It's said to include better transit options like an advanced rapid transit network with dedicated lanes to keep everyone moving. Via will be hosting a series of telephone town halls throughout the year to give more information about the plan and its benefits to the community. The first tel Teletown Hall meeting is tonight at 7. To participate, you must register online at viareimagined.com. You'll receive a notification when it's time to join the call. Find more information on the plan and the town hall, ksat.com. Just search for VIA. And a reminder, starting today, the section of Lock and Terra Parkway will be closed for the next month. Transportation and capital improvements are improving the pavers on the street inside the Rim Shopping Center. The section being worked on is between the I-10 Access Road and Vance Jackson. All the businesses inside the rim will remain open. The project set to wrap up hopefully by February 15th. Well, ever since the KSAT Defender special Broken Blue aired Sunday night, we have gotten a lot of questions about police officer discipline and arbitration process, the arbitration process. So today, Dylan Collier will answer those questions. He's having an SAQ live stream on KSAT.com. If you'd like to submit a question, just head to our website, search Broken Blue. The live Q&A will take place at 11 a.m. Taking a look at your morning headlines, we did not know that counting people could be so expensive. And an investigation has started into that fuel dump by Delta over L.A. Plus, incredible video of a microburst taking out a gym wall during school. And a dog is a man's best friend and great protector. David Sears joins us live. Hi, David. Morning, sir. One reason to get a big dog. We'll have it for you. Just All right. You said right. to tease. It apparently costs a lot of money to count heads. The U.S. Census Bureau is about to spend a half a billion dollars to make sure people in this country are counted. So basically what it boils down to, Leslie, is you're worth a little more than a buck to the census world. Okay, then. That money is going to be used for an ad campaign to remind people how important, safe, and easy it is to respond to the census. Officials want and need an accurate count because the numbers determine how and where federal funds are spent. They are particularly concerned about communities who are underrepresented. The ad campaign is called the Shape Your Future Start Here campaign. The Bureau will start running 1,000 ads on TV, radio, social media, print, and on billboards. The census happens every 10 years. You are looking at a jet flying over L.A., and yes, that is fuel being dropped from those fuel tanks into wings. And that fuel landed on an elementary school, actually landed on six different schools while the kids were playing outside. This is Park Avenue Elementary in L.A. Several students got hit with the fuel. First responders got there pretty quick. 60 people in all were hit, at least 20 children. 11 adults reported minor injuries. Nothing serious. The Delta flight was headed to China but ran into a mechanical problem, so it had to dump fuel so it could make a landing back in L.A. However... There is a procedure for a fuel dump. It is supposed to be done over designated unpopulated areas. Didn't happen this time, so the FAA is investigating. And more incredible video. You're inside a gym at an intermediate school in North Carolina playing with the kids at basketball. Look at that wall just come crashing down. That was a microburst that hit that gym wall. The kids, you can see, just scattered. And part of the roof also came collapsing down. Everybody running away, getting out of that danger. It was RP day. We were playing basketball, and it just sounded like something exploded in there. So I just turned around and was looking at the stage, and it collapsed. And then we started running, and something hit me from behind, and I fell down. And then the glass started breaking. Absolutely incredible, amazing video. Now, some of the kids were taken to the hospital for evaluation, but unbelievably, 
None of them were seriously hurt. They've all been released. Engineers checked out the school, said the rest of the school was safe so students could go back to school. A microburst, a column of sinking air, sometimes called a downdraft, they are produced by thunderstorms, and they also produce a scary moment for those kids. Hey, you know what? Dogs are known as man's best friend and protector. This is happening in Oklahoma City. You can see a man just walk into the woman's house and starts to pet her Great Dane Dubai. Tracy McCoy was home with her son, who is blind. She thought it was her older son coming to the house. He came around the corner, saw the burglar, and then started screaming. And that's when Dubai put all 122 pounds into his bark. And that put a lot of fear into the burglar. And you might as well get out of my house now. Wow. So he Whoa. ran him off. And believe it or not, the police were able to catch the burglar. They brought him back to the house so Tracy could identify him. And he is going to be charged with first degree burglary and ignorance because he messed with the dog. <laughs> He's going to be charged. That's a crime. <laughs> well, the it dog should be, right? It should be. <laughs> The dog at first was, you know, yeah, well, hey, you're like, petting me, you know, you're nice, you're nice. Okay. And then when she screamed, the dog went, oh, not oh, so nice. You're not my friend. <laughs> not yeah. my friend. Well, they, they know. Get you. They just so, know. Um, yeah. But how not would you easily like to have that thing? 122-pound dog. <laughs> yeah, you don't have a Showing chance. Teeth. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, scared not at the notion that my yellow lab is... 25, 30 pounds heavier than a darn Great Dane. Well, yours is a miniature horse. We've already decided that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a big pooch. What do you feed it? A lot. Uh, Whatever, whatever it wants. It wants. <laughs> Purina still makes horse food, right? Yeah. Okay. It, All right. It, that, yeah. That's what it is? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you, David. Right now, 909, 71 degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. What's the fastest you can run, and how long can you run? what it took for an Oregon man to break the treadmill world record. A Bear County jail inmate taking his frustration out on a trio of bailiffs. That inmate now facing serious charges. Paul Venema joins us a little later on for a debrief on David Murphy's trial. And San Antonio is muy excited this morning because a new photo exhibit is opening. It's all about Selena. It's opening at the McNay Art Museum. Erica Hernandez is there with a live look inside coming up next. It is now 9.13. We've been talking about this all morning. A new installation. Well, no, actually, right now we're taking you live. This is um, Speaker Nancy Pelosi announcing the managers of the uh, upcoming impeachment trial. Yeah, if you'd like to watch the press conference, which is happening as we speak, we're live streaming it right now on ksat.com. Now, moving along. Now, we've been talking about this all morning. A new installation of the, at the McNay Art Museum honoring Selena. It opens to the public today. Indeed, our Erica Hernandez joining us live from right now inside the McNay with more. Good morning, Erica. Hi, Erica. Hey guys, good morning. Well, Siempre Selena Forever is a of five photographs that tribute to the legendary late singer. Now, the, here's a look at video of the installation that has been put in here over the last couple of uh, days here at the McNay. Now, this, these photos were taken by uh, John Dyer. They were taken in 1992 and in 1994. This is a part of a bigger fashion exhibit that will be here at the, McZay, the McNay in the coming weeks. Now, this exhibit opens this morning at 10 a.m. and also will be here until July 5th. Now, I want to really show you some of the photos now. This first photo here is, uh, was taken in 1995, I believe, and you can actually recreate this photo here. There's an interactive area right here where you could stand and recreate that same photo. You really get the essence of her personality in these photos. You'll see them throughout. There's five and then there's a, a video that plays along with it with her music here at the McNay. This is a really unique exhibit and it's really exciting to see it here at the McNay. And the next half hour we're going to speak to the curator of this exhibit as well as the McNay CEO about how they got this exhibit here and what it means to San Antonio. Mark Leslie. Feeling it's going to be very popular. It is. Hi Erica, thank you. Oh yeah. How long do we have to put up with this weather? Through, to, uh, excuse me, tomorrow, through Friday. Wow, couple yeah, more and then, days. then we'll see some changes. And then, and it's warm as it's been all week long, mm -hmm. we are going to start to see some cooler temperatures coming in here, progressively getting colder. And it looks like it's going to stay on the cooler side than next week. FYI, good to have you here. Yeah. Well, thank you. Welcome yeah. to the 9 a.m. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much. Mm, a lot welcome. Of folks on vacation, on assignment, on jury, jury duty. duty. So yes, <laughs> everything else is going People on. getting married, cats People and dogs. Married, cats uh, and, yes. Anyway, yeah. hey, speaking of warm temperatures, this morning. Wow. I know, very warm. Very warm. So far, the low temperature has been about 69 degrees, which is more like the normal low temperature throughout May or right around mid-September. Our normal low temperature is 41 degrees, so obviously we were almost 30 above normal. And if this does hold up through midnight, that would tie for the warmest January low temperature, which was about uh, seven years ago on the 29th of 2013. Yep, very low. It's going to be another warm one tomorrow morning as well. Lots of clouds. Didn't have quite as much fog as we've had the past couple of days. Still, there was some out there. We had a lot of mist and drizzle this morning. We do still have some fog from Uvalde over toward uh, Rock Springs, Del Rio, and then further out northwest of our viewing area. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I mean, there's hints of it around. There may be a little bit of mist. The roads may still be damp in some places. And we're at 71 right now, so we obviously haven't moved that much in the past couple of hours. Uh, 67 Bandera Comfort and 72 right now in Castroville and these dew point temperatures. Wow, the humidity out there. This is like mid summer, uh, late summer kind of humidity when you have these dew points in the mid and upper 60s and even some low 70s around here. And that is going to, well, it's been helping out with the fog and that's going to feed some showers though over the next couple of days. So here's a computer model through today. We're gonna have a lot of clouds around, maybe a hole in the clouds here and there few and far between. Then we get into tomorrow and it's going to be interesting because we still have a couple of different computer models have different solutions on what's going to be happening. There's a weak front which is going to be starting to drape down into the area and it's right there basically along that line and this model has it sliding down to the south throughout the morning tomorrow and then barely working its way on through here. Now some computer models want to actually keep us only in say the mid 60s for a high temperature tomorrow. Others don't have that front moving on through here, so we would stay up in the mid 70s. So right now, just kind of splitting the difference and going for about 70 for a high temperature. Now, the other thing that will be happening though is Every, we'll still maintain this flow coming in here out of the southeast, so that's going to help to feed more of these showers going into Friday. And then we've got a more potent front moving on through here. That's going to touch off some uh, showers and thunderstorms, but then that's the one that's also going to be clearing us out a bit once we get into Saturday, especially later in the day on Saturday. We'll see some more sunshine, and then that will be ushering in the colder temperatures. So 74 degrees today at noon, basically cloudy skies, maybe a couple of holes in the clouds here and there. And then 77 for high temperature today. Normal highs right around low to mid 60s. So anywhere from 10, almost 15 degrees above normal. Tomorrow, we are going to be starting off on the mild side again. And like I said, going for 70 right now, splitting the difference. Showers, a fairly decent chance for some showers tomorrow, as well as on Friday, a better chance for some rain, even a couple of thunderstorms thrown in. And then we'll be clearing out on Saturday, breezy conditions on Saturday, and temperatures will slowly start to go downward. Only the low 50s on Monday, perhaps a couple of showers as well. Owls up. All right, Mike, thanks. <laughs> 919, 71 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at 9, 30 miles in three hours. That's what it took for an Oregon man to break the treadmill world record. How he hopes this accomplishment will inspire high school students. Amazon FedEx making amends and a popular burger chain transitioning into a four day work week. We'll check out with uh, Cheddar for your tech and business briefing next. Hello everyone, this is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar. Shake Shack is revamping their work week as their CEO announced that they will roll out a four day work week at a third of their locations for their employees in managerial positions. This comes after Taco Bell increased the salary for their managers to $100,000 earlier this week. Meanwhile, third party merchants on Amazon are allowed to once again use FedEx Ground to ship their Prime orders. The e commerce giant banned Prime deliveries through FedEx Ground just before the Christmas rush, citing performance issues. 
aka late deliveries. And Bitcoin recorded its best start to the year since 2012. The decentralized digital currency is up roughly 21% so far in the year. Analysts believe much of that spike could be attributed to uncertainty surrounding American relations with Iran, as well as an anti-inflationary policy called halving that Bitcoin is slated to enact in May 2020. And that's Chatter Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Pachado from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks, Baker. 924, man in Oregon running all the way to a world record. Mario Mendoza set a new treadmill world record at an Oregon high school yesterday. He ran 50 kilometers, or about 31 miles, for nearly three hours. At an average pace of six minutes a mile, he was running about 10 miles per hour. Mendoza is a national trail running champ and has been USA's Trail Runner of the Year four times. You have to get comfortable with that type of hurt and pain and, and kind of make it your friend. And I think today we accomplished that. Mendoza says he wanted to break the world record to promote fitness and inspire the students watching him. His next race, by the way, is just two weeks away in Arizona. Good for him. Just about 925, 71 degrees. Lots more ahead on GMSA at 9. Selena Forever, that's the name of a new exhibit opening today at the McNay. We're going to check back in with our Eric Hernandez. She's there live with a look at the exhibit. Six Democratic presidential candidates facing off last night. The last debate before the Iowa primary. CNN's Camilla Bernal will be live from Iowa with the key takeaways. He's accused of attacking a trio of bailiffs. The trial of David Murphy now underway at the Bear County Courthouse. Our very own Paul Venema will join us after the break for our weekly court debrief. And as we head to break, quick check of the roads with our friends at TransGuy. 37 to 10, you're watching GMSA at 9. Welcome back. Your time now just about 929. A Bear County jail inmate, apparently unhappy with how his case was proceeding in court, took his frustration out on a trio of bailiffs. That led to a violent confrontation in a holdover cell and some serious charges against the inmate David Murphy. Paul Venema there for the beginning of Murphy's trial. Here's a clip from Paul's story. He manages to put his hand on uh, Huffmeyer's gun. Deputy Pettis said that what happened next was frightening. He starts pulling on his gun like he has his hands on it, like if you're holding something. And he's yanking, yanking, yanking Huffmeyer up and down. Well, Paul Venema joins us now for a debrief. First of all, thanks for being with us, as always. Morning, Paul. First time this year. How common are attacks like this? Uh, surprisingly, pretty common. Not, not quite this violent. Really? But, but the, the, these people these bailiffs deal with, they're not, not happy people. They're not, right. not glad to be there. So they often present a few issues for the bailiffs. So, yeah, this, this happens from time to time. They're ready to go. Any idea what triggered this particular attack, Paul? Yeah, he was he was he had been in, in court before the judge and uh, had uh, some disturbing things for him involving his case. His case was was delayed and he wanted to get it over. He was facing, believe it or not, assault charges. That's what he was there for in the oh, first wow. place. Uh, uh, but anyway, he didn't like the way that went. And so he was unhappy about that as they escorted him back into his his uh, his holdover cell. And that uh, discussion led to fist fight. Well, you mentioned he was there for an assault charge. What does his criminal background yeah, look like? Well, that, that's, and and that's, that's uh, probably going to play big into his punishment should he be convicted. But uh, he was facing assault and choking his, his girlfriend, as I understand, his acquaintance, female acquaintance. So he was facing charges there. And, and, but beyond that, he had some things outside this county, some, again, assault chase, cases. So he obviously has, has some uh, uh, anger issues. Yes, it appears that <laughs> yeah. way, huh? And I, I'm, I'm looking at some of the pictures here as we're, as we're chatting, Paul, and I see, you know, the injuries to some of these uh, deputies, and there, it looks like there's quite a bit of blood out there as the scene as well when it happened. What kind of punishment if he, is he facing if he is found guilty? Well, it, there are three indictments. They're being all tried at the same time. There are three bailiffs, so three, three separate charges of assault of a public servant. However, uh, 
and that run, the punishment range on that is 2 to 20, so it would be 2 to 20 in each. However, he is a habitual. I mentioned earlier he had some charges from another county. Sure. So he's considered a, a repeat offender, a habitual. So that kicks it up the punishment range. Now he's looking at 5 to 99 to life on each of oh, those wow. indictments, which I don't think they would be stacked. But should they want to stack them, they certainly have, the judge has an option. Who is going to decide the punishment if he is convicted? Up to the jury. jury. Up oh, to the jury. jury. And at this point, the jury, because those other uh, uh, cases do not come in during this phase of the trial, during the guilt-innocence phase, they're only brought up during the punishment phase. So the jury doesn't know right now, but the jury will know once they get, should he be convicted, once they get into the punishment phase, they should know what his background is, and that most likely would have some impact on their, their punishment decision. I have a question for you, Paul, and I'm asking because I, I simply don't know the answer to it. Does every court have its own holdover cell for 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 people that are are, are going to be you yeah, know in yeah. court for proceedings? They they do, and uh, it's a really complex uh, setup there at the, at the justice center. Every court has a holdover cell, and, and all these prisoners come from what's called the 1.5, which is a a big holding cell. In, which is essentially a jail within the courthouse. Okay. So they're taken up by elevator into the uh, respective uh, holding cells for hmm. each of the courts. Had no yeah. idea. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. All right, Paul, thanks you so much. Right. We appreciate you being in today. Let's go outside with live cam at 932. Mike is in today with an update on how things are going as we hit midweek. You know, it's been actually better today as far as any fog is concerned. We did have some fog. We still have a little bit of fog kind of scattered about the area. And as you can see, looking out there with the live cam, there is plenty in the way of clouds. Uh, maybe a, a hole or two here in the clouds. This is the uh, visible satellite picture. And we're basically going to be staying socked in today. But like I said, one or two uh, little holes in the clouds sort of uh, here and there. You can see as that loops on through there. But I wouldn't count on just a bunch of sunshine today. And visibility, well, we still got fog out there around Rock Spring as well as Del Rio, but everything else is, is improving. And these temperatures, wow, way above where they should be. We do have some pretty good rain chances coming in here the next couple of days, and then another cold front will move through by the weekend. We'll get that all sorted out and take a look ahead to next week coming up in a couple of minutes. Thank you, Mike. 281 at Almost. Uh, we're jumping through these cameras fast now. 37 at Jones Avenue. We are seeing light traffic on uh, several of the highways here showing up in our Trans Guide camera shots. Well, it is a big day at the McNay Museum today as they open a new exhibit honoring the late Tejano superstar, Selena. Indeed, Erica Hernandez live now as the exhibit is set to open in less than about 30 minutes. Erica. Hey guys, yeah, we're here at the McNay, and I can't say enough how amazing this exhibit is. We're here now with Kate, who is the curator. How did this kind of all come about, and were you able to get these photographs here? We were so lucky. We are actually working on a concurrent exhibition, uh, Fashion Nirvana, Runway to Every Day, and um, Selena was always a part of that. We wanted to have a style icon from our community represented in that exhibition. And so when we were able to secure these photographs, we realized it's really its own exhibition. It needs to have its own space. And that's when y'all came up with this space. That's right, the Selena <laughs> Chapel, as we like to say. <laughs> now, we're here with Rich now, who is the CEO here at the McNade. So tell us a little bit about how much this means having these photos here and how much it also means to San Antonio. That's right. We're the first modern art museum in all of Texas with a very noble mission of engaging everyone in the community. We know the best way to do that, this exhibition is a good example, is showing the community stories on our walls and in our galleries. And Selena represents the very best, the essence of South Texas. Now, y'all had John here, who was the photographer of these pictures. Tell us a little bit about his kind of input on when he took these photos. Well, he really talked about how there was a divide between the first photographs that were taken in 1992, his first introduction to Selena, and she was, you know, as we see her in the photographs, joyful and uh, excited. And then the second photo shoot, which took place in 1994, she had experienced some fame, and he described her as really exhausted, and, and some of that had worn on her. Awesome. So this exhibit will be here all the way until July 5th. It opens in... I mean, it's almost going to open. It's almost 10 o'clock when it opens here to the public, and you can come here and see it at any, part, at any time during the normal hours, right? That's right. We're open. We're closed on Monday and Tuesday, but we're open all of the rest of the week and during museum hours. Awesome. Well, I highly recommend everybody, if you're a Selena fan, to come out here. Even if you're not a fan, these photos are amazing to look at. That's here at the McNay. Mark, Leslie? 
All right, what a great exhibit. Thank you so much, Erica. Appreciate that. My, yes. th there's a little thing, it's called a, a snap of your minute every day. My daughter did it. Mm -hmm. It's like a one second snap of what's going on in your day. She mm -hmm. did it for one year, and at the end of the year, she aired it. It was really cool. I thought that was a really neat thing. That takes a lot of discipline to do. This guy makes that look like nothing. Yeah, we don't know his name, but we want to show you the video. Love it or hate it, selfie culture, full swing, but one photographer ahead of the game for about 20 years. He took a picture every day for the past two decades. 20 years of selfies. Look at his hair. That is hilarious. I want to do this, I think. That's equivalent to 7,263 pictures. So he'd gone to school, moved, traveled the world, all witnessed in the background of his photos. And this isn't the end. He plans to do it, but every decade now, he's going to take a picture every day and release it every 10 years. This, I need to know his name and his age. Uh, we'll try to find out some more. This makes me think of a video almost exactly like this. I saw late yesterday where a man took a selfie of his daughter every day for her first 20 years And of it looks life. like he tried to put it in the exact same position and same background and mm -hmm. everything. That's very neat. Noah Kalina, we believe, is his name. This guy. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks, Oria. 937, 71 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. From healthcare to foreign policy, CNN's Camilla Bernal is live from Iowa after the break with highlights from last night's Democratic presidential debate. Welcome back to Good Morning San Antonio at 9. There are only 19 days left until the Iowa caucus. And last night, six of the Democratic presidential candidates met on the debate stage to tackle issues from health care to foreign policy. But who made the biggest impression? CNN's Camilla Bernal is live from Iowa with a wrap up. Good morning. Good morning, Mark, uh, Leslie. All six of those candidates on stage last night were being very cautious. And even though there were some clashes, they, for the most part, were very careful. And I think that's in part because the four top candidates here in Iowa being Pete Buttigieg, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Joe Biden, they all feel like they can win the state. They all see a path to winning. So none of them seem to want to change the course of this 2020 race. It was the smallest debate stage so far, and the six candidates who made the cut tried to take advantage of that on Tuesday. Climate is my number one priority, and I'm still shocked that I'm the only person on this stage who will say this. I would declare a state of emergency on day one on climate. I don't want cost ever to be a barrier to somebody seeking to attend, attend college. And under my plan, it won't be. A big topic of the night, foreign policy and past and present tensions in the Middle East. We've turned the corner so many times, we're going in circles in these regions. We have lost our standing in the region. We have lost the support of our allies. The next president has to be able to pull those folks back together. I think right now what we should be talking about, though, Wolf, is what is happening right now with Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump is taking us pell-mell toward another war. And of course, there was the issue of women and their ability to win the presidency, brought up after an alleged comment Senator Bernie Sanders made to Senator Elizabeth Warren back in 2018. Can a woman beat Donald Trump? Look at the men on this stage. Collectively, they have lost 10 elections. The only people on this stage who have won every single election that they've been in are the women. Amy so and me. Anybody knows me knows that it's incomprehensible that I would think that a woman could not be president of the United States. But just after the debate, Warren dodging her fellow progressives handshake, signaling things may not have been completely cleared up. And with that, Elizabeth Warren definitely having a moment last night. She focused on electability, which is really the one issue that all six of these candidates really care about. They're all trying to convince uh, people here in Iowa over the next three weeks that they can be the ones to beat Donald Trump. Mark, Leslie. Camilla, tell us more about that awkward handshake snub between Sanders and Warren. Well, look, of course, it was an awkward moment. We all saw it as uh, the debate was live. The only person standing between Warren and Sanders was Tom Steyer. And he was asked 
after the debate, what he heard, what he saw. And he said, look, it was a very awkward moment. I was trying to say goodbye and get out of the way. Uh, he did say that he heard them talking about a future or past meeting, some sort of meeting between the two of them. Uh, so really, we don't know exactly what happened, but you could see it in the video. You could see that the two of them uh, really have not figured out exactly how to handle the situation. And, and we do believe that they were talking about that awkward moment uh, where Senator Elizabeth Warren says that Bernie Sanders said uh, that sh no woman uh, could ever be elected president. Of course, Bernie Sanders continues to deny it. So I think it's something that's going to continue to come up specifically because of the electability factor that it, that keeps coming up in this 2020 race. So what's next for the candidates? Well, look, they are going to have to give their final push here in Iowa. That's really what's next for all of them. They have to uh, be here for the most part if they can. But, of course, impeachment, uh, putting all of this up in the air. The senators, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, they're likely going to have to be in D.C. Uh, for this impeachment trial. They're going to be sitting in D.C., even though they're going to want to be here in Iowa. So it is going to be interesting uh, to see what happens here in the state. Uh, when only Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg can really be here uh, to give those final arguments, those closing arguments, to try to convince Iowans to vote for them. So it is going to be interesting to see how the senators handle the situation and how they make themselves uh, be seen here when they've got impeachment going on in D.C. CNN's Camilla Bernal reporting live from Des Moines, Iowa. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you so much. All right, Mike joins us now talking once again about our Wednesday forecast looking ahead to the rest of the week. This is all going to wind up being a cruel joke. I mean, it is January after all, but at some point, We've got to t take another dive with the thermometer, right? Yeah, we're going to be seeing some colder temperatures, uh, as, and it's going to get steadily colder as we go through like Saturday, Sunday, and the first part of next week. Sure. Unfortunately for Monday for the, the big um, MLK walk, not looking great. Right. We, it is going to be on the, the cold side. So we're looking at temperatures only in, say, the 50s right now, low 50s, and there could be a couple of showers around. I don't think rain's going to be a, a huge deal, but... Just something to sort of keep in mind. The fog was not as much of an issue this morning here in town. Of course, we had a lot of mist. The roads were damp there for a while, and then they did start to uh, dry out somewhat as time rolled on. This is the visible satellite picture, and again, maybe a couple of uh, thin spots in the clouds here and there. I know we did have some pretty good holes in the clouds yesterday afternoon. Um, again, I'm kind of leaning toward the cloudier side. If there are a couple of holes in the clouds, Okay, fine. We'll see a little bit of sunshine, but that's just going to add to the kind of the, the, hum, the humid factor out there and the, the muggy factor, if you will, because we have so much moisture in place. Here's the computer model again. We've got a lot of cloud cover around here, you know, a couple of holes here and there, and that moisture just keeps getting pumped in here overnight, and humidity dew point levels are going to continue to go up. There again is that, that first front, and depending on which computer model brings it through the area or way through the area or doesn't bring it through the area and just kind of hangs out. And that is going to be very dependent on temperatures. So we may see uh, upper 70s down to the south and there could be temperatures that are in the low 60s up in northern portions of the hill country tomorrow. So it's going to be one of those kind of situations. We'll still have a lot of moisture around, a better chance for some scattered showers around the area tomorrow. And then notice how all that moisture continues to get pumped back in here overnight into Friday. And we're starting to see a line with some thunderstorms way out there to the north northwest of us and that's the bit more potent uh, front that's going to move on through here and that'll help touch off a couple of thunderstorms on Friday and here's all this moisture just getting pumped in from the uh, Pacific Ocean and then on the flip side of that there's the winter weather up to the north with some ridiculously cold temperatures I mean look at this we're looking at 90 degrees difference between 71 here in town and 21 below in Cut Bank Montana but all of that really cold stuff for the time being is staying up there to the north because we've got almost a zonal flow, a little bit of a southwesterly flavor uh, flow in the uh, upper level steering winds. And so that is keeping us, you know, pumping the moisture in here, keeping us on the mild side. And as the next trough approaches, that gets the atmosphere kind of going on Friday. Then this front right here, that little uh, dip in the upper level steering winds moves through. So that pulls down some cooler air. Slightly cooler, clears us out a little bit, gets rid of the humidity by Saturday. And here's uh, how we're getting in more of a north to northwesterly flow loft. And so that's the cooler air that continues to kind of filter down in here. And we're looking at those temperatures only in the 50s going into the first part of the week. So, yes, it will be chilly then, kind of making up, I guess, for what we've had this week. And average the two out, and it's going to be almost average temperatures over this two-week span. 
Warm one week, cool the next. 74 today at noon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cloudy skies and yeah, a couple of holes in the clouds are possible, but just leaning toward the cloudier side. 77 for a high temperature today. And then tomorrow we do have fairly decent chance for some showers scattered around the area. Going with 70, it'll be much warmer down to the south and cooler up to the north. And really depending on where that front decides to sort of stop. And then about the same thing on uh, Friday. Showers, a couple of thunderstorms around here. And once we get into Saturday, it is going to be breezy on Saturday. So we are probably going to be seeing higher mountain cedar counts Saturday and then Sunday. And temperatures continue to uh, drop down once we get into the first part of next week. And look at that by Tuesday morning, we're looking at just about 35 degrees around here, which means another pretty good freeze in the hill country. That's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. 10 till 71 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9, and we will be right back. Good morning. Guys, we have some news. Yeah, coming up on live, Renee Zellweger's here. Jess, talking about that film, Judy. Yeah. Plus, Finn Wolfhard from The Turning. We'll see you in a little bit on live. Hey, don't forget, later this morning, we will be answering any questions you might have about the KSAT Defender's Broken Blue Special. You can submit questions about police officer discipline and the arbitration process right now on KSAT.com. Just search for Broken Blue. Dylan Collier will be answering those questions live on our website starting at 11 a.m. Pretty much all hour, we've been looking great on the highways and uh, 37 at Jones Avenue, 410 at Ingram, no exception. Mike? Yeah, and uh, actually, it's been... Better this morning compared to the past couple of mornings. We're going to make it up to 77 today. Primarily cloudy skies. You know, there could be a couple of peaks of sunshine here and there. And then tomorrow, a decent chance for some rain. Friday, showers and a few thunderstorms. And again, temperatures tomorrow are very dependent upon where this front decides to sort of land and stop. And then uh, we do have a more <laughs> land and <laughs> stop. <laughs> Stops further south, we're cool. Or further north, we're warm. Uh, but we will start to cool down starting Saturday with the next more potent front, and that's going to cool us down in through a good chunk of next week. Okie dokie. Spurs heat. David Sears is here. San Antonio back in action. Been off a couple of days after the big win over Toronto. Remember, they came from 18 down. DeMar DeRozan, 25 points. Western Conference Player of the Week. Mm -hmm. Miami is 17 and one at home. Uh oh wow! So this could be a, this could be a tough so one. So David, what do they have tough. to do? They have to score, score more points than Miami. <laughs> 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 ah, you fall for it every time. I do. But uh, it, it'll, it'll be interesting. Jimmy Butler's having a pretty good season. The whole team is having a pretty good season. They've lost a couple, so it's not, you know, it's not a given that they'll win. But the Spurs, Spurs are on a little roll, though. Who's They're coach? Heath, is it still Sp uh, Spolstra? Yeah. Okay. So that's always fun to watch. Yeah. What watch time did you say games. it is? It's at 6.30 tonight. Oh, that early game. So, yeah, but well, it's on the East Coast. Oh, and then so. just a handful of more home games until the uh, Rodeo Road Trip starts. Yep, like so. three or four more home games in the Rodeo Road Trip. And then they got a lot in March and a lot in April, so... The, yep. the schedule kind of turns in their favor, but they're they're still a half game behind Memphis. Memphis. Memphis for right. that uh, hey, eight playoffs. Real quick, you know who Nick Willinda is, right? Nick mm -hmm. Willinda. Yes, he, he's Willindas. the flying Willinda. Yeah. He's the daredevil kind of guy. He does Walks this. along the tightrope right. thing with the. Yeah. He's Listen gonna do it again. Is he really? Mm -hmm. Oh, this one's just poof, mind blowing. That's right. It's part of the upcoming live special ABC March fourth. He's going to attempt to higher wire across an 1,800-foot uh, across a, the, a volcano in Masaya, Nicaragua. Yes, the stunt will mark his toughest and highest high wire walk ever attempted. He actually said he realizes no one's ever attempted it before. Mother Nature is unpredictable. It is the most dangerous walk I've ever attempted, and it is intimidating. Throughout the event, Nick and his family will be featured in interviews about the rigging, planning, and execution. Volcanologists and various professionals will be on site to lend their expertise. Again, it is coming up 7 p.m. Wednesday, March 4th on ABC. ABC. Is it a dormant volcano, I hope? I was going to say. Oh, thanks for being with us, everybody. Doesn't Have sound a great like day. it, Mike. Oh, it's mm. Gary. Roast.